Yes. Welcome back to another episode of Act Root to Fruit. My name is Marcel, and I'm on a quest to dig into the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences. And then cover up my face too. That helps when I'm talking to people on screens. I don't like to see my face. Um, so today we are, you know, we're, I'm taking this approach of, of, of receiving help from different guides. And today we are talking to the one and only Yvonne Barnes Holmes. And actually, how do you, how do you accurately say your first name? Yvonne. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yvonne. Yvonne. Okay. Yvonne. Yeah. Because I, I speak I speak Spanish, and so certain names I you know I I really struggle with because I know how to say it in Spanish, but not. So I'm sure I've been called uh, worse. <laughs> Yvonne. Yvonne Barnes Holmes, the one and only. And so so this uh, this podcast is about getting into the the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences. So that uh, the fruit that we deliver as clinicians is as pristine as possible. And so we've started out with talking to some folks around the stance in ACT and, and what, what the different therapies, the tech, technologies in the contextual behavioral sciences ask of us as clinicians. Went on to talk to uh, um, evo- um, uh, Franz DeWall about evolution and, and then some behaviorists. And now we're getting into RFT. And, um, and so I guess my first question is a kind of a true or false question. If we could start there. Sure. Sounds easy. So, okay. Is it true or false that RFT was discovered on an alien spacecraft in the desert and you scientists are unpacking it? Uh, I wish it was true, but it's actually false. No, okay. All right. All right. So what, where do we start with RFT? What it, why is it important to, to the ACT clinician? Um, it doesn't have to be important to any clinician because it's a science, okay. right? Because clinicians can do really good work without science. But if you want to do functional analytic psychotherapy, it's really important because it is a way of helping you understand and explain functions. Okay. And um, so it depends on the extent you want your clinical work to be directly driven by Mm. scientific work. And that's just a matter of personal choice. It's not a rule. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I I really, that's uh, about as humble as an answer as, as I could have expected for that question. So, so we want to be functionally driven. And when I hear the word functional, I think of the word purpose. No, absolutely not. No. Okay. Functional analytic, as in your job is the analysis of functional of functions, the functions of the behavior that you see and the functions of the behavior mm-hmm. that you engage in, which is why okay. I really prefer functional analytic to functional. Huh. Well, can you say more about that? Because our job as, as functional analytic psychotherapists is to analyze the functions of all the behavior happening by the client, by us, to the client, in our lives, in their lives. I mean, all behavior by definition, if you think this way, is functional because it wouldn't be in the repertoire otherwise. But mm-hmm. what I'm saying is we have set it up so that our job is the analysis of functions that are relevant to their current lives and their current unhappiness. Mm-hmm. That's a very different game. That means that's your job. You signed up for that to be your job. You either did yeah. or you didn't. And if uh-huh. you do, it's what you do. Okay. Yeah. And so we're kind of, I'm kind of backtracking. And like I mentioned before we started this, uh, we actually, let me backtrack some more. I didn't introduce you appropriately. Okay. Oh, that's um, fine. Dr. Barnes Holmes has uh, been contributing immensely to the field of the contextual behavioral sciences for for a while now, and uh, um, especially in the field of of RFT. and And I'll mention it now, and I'll mention it again. Your your website is just such a phenomenal place to go and see um, therapy in action and this kind of therapy in action. Especially, I like the the sequential. Um, the sequential work that you did. It's not just, you know, a quick shot of, of what therapy could look like, but how is it over time? Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful work. And so 
and she's at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And so, so yeah, this, this is about folks who are coming to this who maybe aren't um, behavior analysts. And they're, they're, we're trying to kind of go back and say, what, what, what of the foundational stones do I need to have in place to really be doing this with accuracy and depth? Um, it's more about doing it with precision, right? Okay. <laughs> than accuracy okay. and depth for for RFT and for the application of RFT, it's it, it's precision is key. I mean, there are, I mean, it has its behavioral roots, and the more you know about behavior analysis, the more you'll be familiar with the analysis of functions, and that will be a big help to you. But sometimes that's a hindrance because the traditional way of thinking about functions is quite different for RFT because the behavior that the functions are attached to, the relating behavior, um, it doesn't sit comfortably with a lot of traditional BA folks. So it really is, in many ways, post skinnerian which is what the original book was called. So it's, I think it's, it's, if you're comfortable with the analysis of functions, that's a starting spot. And then you got to get comfortable with thinking about functions and beha- complex behavior in a certain way. So it's got these two key pillars, I think, that you need to get comfortable with and learn to jump over. Okay. Um, and if you don't jump over them, it, it, it's quite difficult for folks, to be honest. You can get a, a sort of compensatory track if you're a very, very experienced therapist you've almost learned a different way of talking and thinking and analyzing functions. And you can be quite easy to train, even though you were never behaviorally trained, but because you can just compensate by clinical experience. So that's the sort of other track, but it's, it's hard to actually really learn and know and experience if you have no training in analyzing functions of complex behavior. Mm-hmm. It's, it's quite hard to get to and really get it. I don't mean in a clever way. I just mean actually really know what we're going on about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So could you could you <clears throat> do some hand-holding now into, into maybe that first pillar and what, what starting to, to absorb that is? What that's like? So, yeah, I mean, the first thing, the, the first, first sort of cautionary note or, is RFT is nowhere near as complex as people think. Okay. It's like evolution. Evolution is a very simple set of ideas and concepts that just have profound implications and the vastness is in the implication and not in the concept. And and so so basically RFT has two bits of it and one is layer one, the behavioral bit, and one is layer two, the RFT bit. And the behavioral bit is is quite simply that this is a pragmatic move. This is not about uncovering truth. It's about what works to understand behavior and change it. That's all. And for us, looking at functions and seeing behavior as packages of functions, that just works really well. That's why we do it. Mm-hmm. So behavior is done because it has a function to that organism and that environment. That's all it is, really. The second layer is the RFT layer that says that that function has meaning because it's inside a story that a complex organism creates. And so it's a dynamical, it's like, it's like, you know, the, the music is behavior analysis and the song um, is RFT. And so it's a bit like in behavior, you know, one is the, the function um, and one is the relating. So everything you do, one has a function to it and two, it has a story element to it because you don't do things that aren't consistent with the story that you've created about your life. So all the songs you sing, they all come off a pretty constant theme tune and that theme tune is what you learned to be about during your history. So there's the functional bit that comes from behavior analysis and there's the story relating bit that comes from RFT and really all RFT did is that it glued the the two of them together in a very symbiotic way. So it basically says everything you do as a complex vertical organism is part of a story about who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially, and our job in therapy is to find out that story and find out why that story holds onto your feet and your behavior the way it does. And we just unpack that and change it. (laughs) It's as simple as that. Very simple. <laughs> it's just really hard to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, simple but hard. 
So, so for those of us who are familiar with the, the core processes of ACT or maybe functional analytic psychotherapy or, or compassion focused therapy, the, the, the rudiments of those, uh, I'm wondering what, what more does, um, do you direct us to, to do, to, to, to understand, uh, RFT and, 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 uh, the, the next, what I'm hearing you say is, is RFT is like kind of a, the, the, the next wave of behavioral analysis. It is the next wave. Um, it depends on whether you believe that the last wave delivered an adequate, the kind of complex human behavior, because I don't believe it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, just, I, I believe they formed the basis of it. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know anyone on the planet, in all honesty, who could say that they could take Skinner's concepts and use them to directly influence their clinical work on a moment-by-moment basis with a complex client. I mean, if you can find someone, show me them, because I, I couldn't, and I couldn't find anybody who did. And as a clinician, I, I would like to achieve to be, I would like to know that a behavioral science could help me do that and I fundamentally believe that it can I have never lost that scientific ambition but I do appreciate it's an enormous challenge and I I am absolutely convinced and and people can believe me or not I've seen it from my own eyes that if you if you use RFT in a very full way it can give you the most incredible insight and direction in the understanding and, and changing complex human behavior, if you let it, the science is at a place where it can do that. And I don't think Skinner science was ever at that place. And I don't think RFT before five years ago was at that place. Mm. What, what's changed in the last four or five years? We've updated it. That's, all <laughs> it. That's just the truth okay. of it. We, we took okay. its basic concepts and we subjected them to more detailed empirical analysis and we added to them. And we used our clinical work to ask experimental questions so that the left hand and the right hand, the basic folks and the clinical folks have been working together. And we've tested the theory and adjusted the theory until it can start to do what clinicians really need it to do instead of stopping short. Okay. Yeah. And so you talked a little bit about this post Canarian. Can you talk a little bit more about just just so we know that it you know the history not not my uh, assumption that it came from an alien spacecraft? Uh, the history of RFT was just a, you know um, a recognition by Steve Hayes and Aaron Brownstein that Sidman's account of equivalence gave you a step forward from Skinner's account of verbal operands because it allowed you to explain novel behavior, really complex novel behavior that genuinely had never been trained. So um, they used that stepping stone to, to really grapple with novel behavior, but take it to levels of complexity that Sidman's equivalents hadn't done. And that's all it is. So you've got step one Skinner or step one Pavlov, step two Skinner, step three Sidman, step four Steve, mm-hmm. step five Dermot. Okay. And, and yourself and us, and it's just been a in a, you know I, I'm naming the people, but they were all teams. But it's just a series of teams taking over where another team essentially sort of left off, and and but yeah. nothing got thrown out in a sense. It was build on, build on, build on. I mean, Skinner's concept of the generalized operand still stands in RFT stronger than in any other account. So nothing really got thrown out. Things just essentially got added to. And Steve, of course, had a, a strong clinical interest, and the the demand of the science to reach clinical complexity, I think, was a very guiding principle for him, and, and thank goodness it was. Mm-hmm. So it's just about really adding to Skinner's concept of the verbal operant to explain new behavior in a Sidmanian type way, but to allow it to explain really complex novel human behavior. And mm-hmm. you'd end up with it. Anybody goes on that search, you'd end up with RFT. Okay. And so, yeah, one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, traditional behavior analysis analysts 
work with folks who are uh, struggling, you know, with autism and, um, and also more kind of, uh, and, and other behavioral issues is what I'm hearing you say is that, that that's kind of the limits of traditional behavior analysis. And that's why it hasn't, that's why it's not something that you see in clin- more clinical settings. I think that's absolutely spot on with no disrespect to the behavioral community, yeah. but I think the behavioral yeah. community themselves, I mean, at, to that level, they're brilliant. They, they, they're just perfectionistic. They're perfect. But we are talking about a type of complexity and a type of untrained behavior that that they do not have the, the models to understand, and then they don't have the techniques to change them. You had to change the model or the framework in a way. Um, in order to reach that sort of complexity, and it's it's of no disrespect to behavioral folks yeah. to say that what yeah. they what they got from Skinner can't just can't go far enough. Yeah, yeah, we're we're I I, I think we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, absolutely, it's a foundational work. It's just we just needed to add to it. Yeah. Okay. And so, where do you where do you start your students? I mean, assuming they come to you with uh, you know very little understanding of RFT. Well, I mean, it, it, it's been different in, in Ghent because we're, our, we've got a big grant and our job is to do research. But I, I always start my students at a very humane type position. Two things. One is helping people is really important to you because it doesn't have to be. Why do you? Not everybody. There's no rule says it has to be. And the second position is you have to believe everybody's equal fundamentally must believe everybody's equal because there's a, there's a movement inside traditional behavior analysis that's still played off the defect model. Okay. And I, I just don't believe you can do that, this work and hold on to that position. I just don't think they're compatible. Really and equal, equal in what way? Everybody is, fun, is fundamentally given the same rights to, to achieve their potential, just the same as everybody else. And in doing therapy, you give them that right. You acknowledge that. They have different starting positions, but they've got a fundamental right to be as good as the next person and whatever that will look like. And then the third piece, the third element that has to go in is I think people have to be tuned into the the power of seeing behavior as packages of functions over topographies. Mm. It's just a very useful thing to do. And if the, if the three starting positions are there, uh, you know, I, I could take any student and inspire them. They mightn't believe it or they mightn't want to devote their life to it, but they would listen to me and they would understand why I, I think this is such a compelling story. Yeah. And then the choice is theirs. I don't make choices for people. I just support them. Yeah. Okay. So could we, could we lean in more to the seeing, seeing these patterns of behavior? I'm wondering if you could, if you could talk more about that. So it's, it's okay, so there are two levels. You can see something on a surface level or you can see something at like a chemical level, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to really know how behavior started in the repertoire, it's sort of better that you look down at the chemical level because you can really understand all the bits and pieces. And so if you really want to understand it, you really got to look look at why did it exist in the first place and why does it look the way it looks and why do certain packages hang around with each other and not other packages? Well, seeing functions is just like that. It's like the surface level of the behavior doesn't actually matter. What really matters is why the behavior is there, why do so much of it, why do it in certain contexts and why not do other types of behavior? Yeah. And then when you really, in that sense, when you understand as much of it as you can, then I think you're in a position to change. But I, I just, I just don't see the logic of trying to change something that you don't actually understand the dynamics of the, of the behavior of the organism and its context. So for me, it's a three way thing. There's the behavior, there's the organism and there's a the context and they're sort of operating in a dynamical system. Yeah. And I think if you understand that system using a set of principles, Changing it becomes relatively straightforward. Understanding it is can be very, very difficult depending on what, what tools and measures you use. So I, I just see that surface level of behavior is largely irrelevant, sometimes just an orienting exercise. But my job is to is to ask why is the rat running that way and not that way? And why does he do it so often? And why does he do it when it makes him tired? And how come he started doing that in the first place? 
Mm-hmm. So that's just asking deeper questions, not what you see with the eye, but what you look at under a microscope. And that's essentially all we do. We just look at behavior at a different lens, not at a mentalistic lens, at a functional analytic lens. And so I'm, I'm wondering how someone starts to do that. Um, one, one can start to see that topography of behavior um, doesn't tell you about function. You can start to see a mismatch. Uh-huh. You know, there are many reasons why someone cries, but they all look like they're crying. But there are so many reasons why someone cries for a particular length of time at a particular intensity when the particular person is present. Yeah. And I think your answer stops really short if you just say she must have been sad. That when you see that that's not that that answer won't help you change anything, then you start to realize that you've got one hand tied behind your back as a behavior change person. Mm-hmm. So then you are, okay. So where do I look then if I want to change it? Well, you've got to start asking the right sort of questions, but okay. they do get more complex. Okay. And then what, you what, start asking those questions. Can can we ask some of those right now in this in this example of you know someone crying? Yeah. So for example, I mean you could you could say, okay, well, someone um, could be crying because she can't regulate emotion. Yeah. It's just coming out of her. She's just a vehicle. You could say someone is crying to have an and and someone is crying to have an impact. On another, I want you to know how sad this is for me. I'm not saying anything. I just crying is like a shared experience in the second case, but it's not a shared experience in the first case. It's just a person being a vehicle for their own emotion. Mm-hmm. Then, even as another as a bystander, there are two very different things that you would experience as the person around. I mean, in the second case, if someone is crying as a shared experience, maybe you want to share the experience with them. If someone is crying as a reflection of their own emotion, maybe you should stay away. Okay. Yeah. They're totally different. They're totally different. For the person having it, they're totally different experiences. And for the person watching it, they're totally different experiences. So what you should do next should be a totally different experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very, very complex thing to do with sitting across from someone that you're trying to you're really trying to hold space for. It's very complex. It's also very emotionally demanding. Yeah. As a very cooperative species, most of us don't see pain in another person and do nothing about it and be comfortable. <laughs> and it's, we're just talking about a really trivial example of crying. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's challenging. It's unsettling yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it's complex. Well, and and also for for me, I I know that I'm someone who intellectualizes too much, or I just you know I'm in my head more than I'm in my embodied experience a lot, and it's tuck, tuck. I, what's that? Tuck tuck, tuck. tuck. yeah, and, 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 but and so it, learning this and considering this, one of my fears is that I'm gonna I'm gonna be you know up here more than down here. Well, then you've completely missed the point. You can you've completely missed the application of RFT. Okay. The application of RFT. If you really understand RFT's theory about the deictic relations, that that the relations, what we call deictic framing, which is I essentially having a perspective on I, mm-hmm. and one of the abstractions of the theory. The theory is a scientific theory. It doesn't make predictions so much about clinical application but if you abstract quite directly from it right it it basically supports the view that that i'm going to abstract a bit from it but i'm trying to make it so your audience can understand what i'm saying it's about i the sense of i being anchored right here right now in my direct experience and still holding all my indirect experience from behind me so it's there's an accumulated history that's carried as part of who i am right here right now painful not nice not positive negative whatever it is it has to be carried so there's a there's an openness and an honesty and dare i use it an authenticity it's not a great word but just about about anchoring yourself 
in your current experience being gone and having the, all that knowledge that you bring with you. So it doesn't like, it's not a simple move. It doesn't like complexity. Yeah. And so a lot of the clinical application we do of RFT is about training people to have both feet in that place and move from there. Because if you move from there, it doesn't matter where you go. It matters where you come from. It matters the position you start and the fact that you moved. It's really all about process over outcome. And that yeah. is totally consistent with RFT. And it's very consistent with ACT, the way I learned ACT. Uh -huh. So I think if you don't really understand that and you get heady, and headiness is a way you pull off that groundedness. Yeah. I think you've missed something very valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I guess I'm also just getting at the, the beginning stages of trying to, to really do a functional assessment of behavior. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Absolutely right. But, yeah. but behavior is never random. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's always predicted by history, it comes in packages. You've got to learn. I often think of us as, as people who crack codes. It's a code. You just cut it, find the algorithm. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're, you're kind of seeing the matrix yeah. from where you're, you're sitting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And our job is to get sharper and sharper and seeing the individual constellation. But yeah. there, are, there are patterns. And do you, do you have concerns about people who don't, you know, who are just kind of like, you know, maybe saying milk, milk, milk with their clients or pulling out the finger traps? I mean, I, uh, I have concerns for clients who aren't getting the improvement they need. Mm -hmm. um, but they're probably not being harmed by it. They're probably getting a little improvement. I have a sadness that we're not better at our jobs. I have a real sadness about the fact that as psychologists, we got away with doing a half job and convinced ourselves we were brilliant. And only because the people who need us, it's not their fault. They are the way they are. So I have, I feel a great sense of guilt and sadness. But and they, just, they, they sometimes is us, right? <laughs> and they sometimes <laughs> is us, exactly. There's a humility yeah. to that too. So I just, I just want, I, I would just like people to open themselves experientially and professionally and a more, a more effective form of learning. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. And that reminds me, I have a question about something you said earlier in terms of, of seeing the why of the behavior and seeing the function of the behavior, I think one of the things that, that I see in, in, in myself and I've seen in, in, in um, more neophyte therapists is this tendency to tell the client, kind of explain to them, like that's the therapy. No, we never do that. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. Why not? Because that's not what, I mean, I, <sighs> Let me just give you an example so you can illustrate why you don't explain to your children about parenting. Okay, thank right. you. you. You explain some of what you're doing, but you don't give them all the dynamics of yeah. parenting because close relationships don't work like that. When you tell someone you love them, you don't keep telling them why. You just, it's just a shared experience. And, and our, I see my job in therapy is to guide clients towards developing meaningful, shared, honest, open relationships that, that can take bumps. And explaining is not great at helping relationships build like that. And also, uh -oh. uh, psychologists, we can be hierarchical and... Mm -hmm. There can be a hierarchy between a client and a therapist where the therapist is better. And I just think that's toxic to all human relationships. And that's something I do not want to have with my clients. So if I explain stuff, it just reinforces that idea that we're hierarchical. And that, that's just, I just don't think that's helpful. So I do very little explaining. Okay. All right. Do you I think that think it, it, it would be helpful? It, it doesn't work. Yeah. 
And it's, and it's, it, you know, I mean, I think it's m- more about the, the clinician than anything, you know, more, more about kind of feeling stinky. some gratification. Yeah. It is stinky. Come on, I mean, that's stinky. Like, yeah. If you want to go and have a power trip, go somewhere else and do it, but don't do it in the face of somebody who needs you. It's, it's not the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm with you. And, uh, so I'm wondering if, well, you think it would be more helpful right now to talk about some of the terminology in RFT or to go in a different direction, to, to, to speak to those who are, are curious about it and want to know more? I, yeah, I think you have to be careful with terminology because terminology does take a long time to learn mm-hmm. the subtleties of it. Um, because the phenomena that we're working with is complex. The behavior is complex. So each concept has a big job to do. Like the concept of behavior being arbitrarily applied, relating being arbitrarily applicable, that for us is a core process. So that simple concept has got a lot of work to do. So it's going to take a long time for someone to learn what that concept really means. Mm-hmm. So... I just, if people are learning the concepts, they need to be prepared to take a lot of time to do it. Sometimes it's just more useful to inspire people by talking about how far down the road of understanding and changing complex behavior you can get with those con- concepts. Okay. So yeah. one is about the, the science and one is about the application and it depends which game you want to play, but, but the science game takes a long time to learn as all good sciences do. That's all. Yeah. There's no uh, drive-by. There ain't no shortcut. Uh, there's no, there's no pamphlet. Well, there shouldn't really be because, you know, yeah. if, if it was that easy, psychology would have worked it out a long time ago, but it's complex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so so you're a champion for the, the power that this can bring your clinical work and the, the gifts you no can doubt. bring to your... Yeah. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I And I really... I don't mind if people don't believe me or aren't convinced. I, someone I met a few years ago said the thing about Yvonne is she's not very convincing, but she's totally convinced. That just suits me fine. Because <laughs> you're going to be convinced of what you're going to be convinced of. My yeah. job is to explain to you why I believe what I believe. Yeah. And then you can believe whatever you believe. But I've, I've lived and done this work for a very long time, both on the science end, on a personal end, and on a mm-hmm. clinical end, and, and it's never let me down. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you said something earlier that uh, struck me as a point I wanted to return to. And um, you said, act the way I learned to act. Mm-hmm. What did yeah. that mean? It means that I think people learn it in different ways. And yeah. it, it reflects, a, it's a, just a genuine sense of unease about the way I see it trained now. Mm-hmm. And I think it has lost very important pieces that were there before. And, and without simplifying it too much, I think it has, it has pulled further and further away from its functional analytic and behavioral roots. And in doing so, I believe pulled further and further away from where RFT was going. I think it got weaker and weaker. Yeah. And yeah. I, 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 that's just my view. And that, and that is what I see. And, you know, I work with a lot of people trained in act in new ways. So this isn't just coming from me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess that begs the question what what would be a dream sequence of 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 learning this if you if you had you know i don't know maybe a, your child was coming into the field and you were ushering your child through the the stages of learning this where are you starting them i would always start them in experiential work i'm a hard firm believer that everybody should begin with experiential work and everybody should continue with experiential work and everybody yes. should finish with experiential work. Okay. And parallel to that, it's about building your clinical experience under the watchful eye of somebody who's made those moves before under supervision. Okay. And and in terms of, of literature, where what's could you could you speak to some of the you think what do you think are uh, the most vital books? None of them. Or art- hmm. 
I, 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 I only ever use one book, and that is the original um, Hayes, Drosel, and Wilson okay. book. I think it was 1999, the first act book. I think okay. it was beautifully written. I think it was elegant. I think it was creative in its metaphors. I think it was as close to RFT and its behavioral roots and functional contextualism as you, as we could have been then. And I've read an awful lot of nonsense since, and I've read some act books that I think are frankly awful. I mean, they're I think they're completely wrong. I really do. I, I do. Um, yeah. Not wrong, wrong and bad, but I just think if I had done that work with those clients, I wouldn't have done I wouldn't have been where I was. So I I think if people just read that first book and then just do the experiential and the clinical work and the supervision work, I think that's all you need. I'll not make the book companies a lot of money that way, I'm afraid, but <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh so so uh, absorb that that book as much as possible. I just think there's just, that and that book has got great signposts. And directions and they were they were simple and creative and I think it's a beautiful book. Okay. All right. Yeah. So something I meant to ask you before we got going, and I'm just gonna have to ask you now is is I'm wondering if you'd be willing to do some um maybe some experiential work with me here. Well that, yeah, I'm happy to do it with anybody anywhere, but you mightn't like what you see. Okay. Well I, I I appreciate your you are uh, you hold no punches and uh, absolutely and I, not. I I love but it. But at the same time, I wouldn't hurt a fly. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, I don't know. I guess I guess I'm. I guess we could come at it a few different ways. One of the ways I thought like we could come at it is I could just talk a little bit about uh, a general struggle that I have in my clinical work, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, and we could unpack that and. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, uh, we can, we can see your, your craft in, in, in action. Mm-hmm. How does that sound? So are you, are you going to talk, is this a self struggle? Or is this a therapist struggle or is it both? It's both obviously. Both. Yeah. What's, what's the difference? I guess is my question. It's a fine line between them. That's all because it just allows me the place to an insight into the place you're operating from. Are you essentially saying you want to help me be a good therapist or, and, or are you saying you want to help me to be a human being that I want to be, but I feel like I'm not there yet. So I just it just allows me a certain permission. I see. I see. Move. Yeah, I, I I I'm open to either. I guess I'm coming. What, what I'm going to talk about is a, a a common struggle that I have in therapy, and uh, and um, has changed over the years. But um, I think it's 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 maybe will be useful to to talk about and and uh, we'll see. How does that sound? Okay. Okay, you back? Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I'll just I'll just start talking and we'll see what happens. Yeah, can I interrupt yeah. you regularly? As as much as you want. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so the, for the the entirety of my career, um since I've started doing experiential work, I've worked in community health agencies and uh, working with folks who are mostly immigrants, Latino immigrants, and uh, uh, several different places uh, um, around the country. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've struggled with is working with folks who I think are are, uh, inspired to come to therapy because they want to... um, they want to get uh, a disability or get a, you know, get a, a um, I don't know what they call it in Europe, but in here it's called, you know, social security check or disability. Yeah, sure. yeah your benefits. Yeah. And I recognize that as a very, um, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a survival mechanism. And, and I, I recognize that, but I guess I, I notice myself kind of pulling back a little bit when I, when that's, when that's heavy on, on my mind kind of, and, and, and that's not, you know, it doesn't have to just be in terms of, um, disability. It could, could be about, you know, some legal issue or something that they're, I'm sensing there's some, they're, they're being disingenuous in terms of, you know, really being there. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and what I pick up on sometimes is that, you know, I, I, I just run a, a I run up a lot of, against a lot of roadblocks where they're, they're, you know, I'm trying to do, or I'm trying to kind of do some work and it's, it's staying, 
it's kind of staying at the surface or it's just, you know, mm-hmm. it's, and I, and I really, I really have this kind of internal battle around that. Like, how do I proceed in, in being, I guess, authentic and, 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 um, holding space for, for someone who I don't think is really, you know, trying to be here or not so, trying to be here, but you know, yeah. yeah. So, but it does sound a bit like you're wanting to lead them. I want it to be meaningful. You know, whether or not they're, you know, they're, they, 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 their whole reason for being, seeing me is because it's going to help them further their cause, which isn't about personal, I guess what I'm saying is personal growth. Um, I, I just, I just want it to be meaningful. I don't want, I don't want to be wasting anyone's time and I prefer, you know, my time not to be wasted. It still looks like that there's a little piece of meaningfulness, the meaning of meaningful still feels for you slightly more comfortable if you're leading them. Mm. Like yeah. a little bit like I'm going to say it slightly harshly I don't mean it like this but a little bit like as lot under your terms and conditions mm. okay like yeah. it just has a better feel like you're comfortable with your own terms conditions and you, you like you like working off a script that's off your own terms and conditions yes uh, it sounds like something my partner has said to me in the uh, past, couldn't possibly comment on that. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, saying, that yeah, there's yeah. a certainty inside that which I think you're okay. you're comfortable with. Yeah, and you and you like and you sort of demand. It. That's a very strong word, but I'm just saying that you're looking for you you want to see a certainty because your terms okay. and conditions are set out and they're familiar and they let you know where you stand and. And and the flip side of that is my guess is you don't do confusion or uncertainty. I guess you just don't do them much. Yeah. Then that's that could be your Achilles heel. So I'm hearing you kind of tell me, explain to me what's going on with me right now. Well, and the, and you, well. I, Right now, you're in the context of this therapy discussion we're having. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, to be fair to you in that therapy context, you are being put in the position of a social worker a bit, right? Mm -hmm. There's a social work element to this about getting benefits and whatever. Yeah. And, and, And sometimes you have to do a little bit of social work. That's not really our field, but that's what that situation demands, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's useful to know when you're being a social worker, right? And when you're being a social worker plus one. Plus so one? Part, plus one, yeah. That means here's a social worker and here's a psychologist, right? I see. Okay. And I think it's important to know the differences yeah. because one is very different. One is like, let's sign these forms and let's make sure everybody's safe and got a house and, and whatever, mm-hmm. those really important things. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. frankly no point on earth being a psychologist if someone doesn't have a roof over their head. It's a waste of time. Mm-hmm. Right. Get the roof first. Yeah. So work out when you have to be a social worker and work out when that's all you have to be. If that's all they're looking for, just be a social worker. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I appreciate that. Right. And then when the context permits it and the person is willing to engage at that level, not when you think they are, when they are, then it's finding out what key fits what lock. What is it about psychology that seems like it would be most helpful at that time? And could be the simplest thing. I mean, if they're coming in at a part of what you do is social work you're not going to unpack the self are you i mean seriously you don't have permission to do it you don't have time to do it the context probably not conducive to it so i probably wouldn't do it yeah but it's about finding what door is open what door do they give you permission to go through and then how can you do that in that tight time context that you have I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to do therapy. <laughs> yeah. I, I like how you I like how you put it. So it's 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 knowing it's like, you know, knowing what you can control, knowing what you can't, knowing the difference. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. And I think part of the reason why you're struggling with that is because you do struggle with uncertainty and it is uncertain. And I'm, I'm suggesting you bring some clarity into this. You separate the door from the window. You separate the social work job from the psychology job. Mm-hmm. And you narrow the constraints of the psychology job. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and it, that I'm wondering too about how the rest of our field outside of the CBS therapies sets the tone for the work that we do. I think that a lot of people see therapy as just a place where you come and talk about, you know, your week and things you did and you just, you just talk about the culture of therapy is me just telling you, you know, the fight I had with my, my spouse and, and what I did last week. And yeah, I, I think that's a bit of a waste of time. I think it's, yeah. I think what people need is transformation. I think we all probably need a big whack of transformation at least once. And we're just not all willing to do that. We're just not all at a place that's conducive to that. And yeah. I, I think a lot of us need transformation. And I think psychology has done a pretty terrible job at being transformative. So it has taken a slightly soft option. Mm. At working up at the topographical surface level of I said this mm-hmm. and she said this is our relationship working and should I should I not leave and mm-hmm. and that's look that's if that's the game you want to play and if that's the game somebody wants to pay you to play then if you want to play go ahead and do that but I've got people I need to transform who need me yeah yeah and, I, and I'm happier in the transformation game and it just sort of suits my adversarial yeah. style but and I and I'm good at it so if people are up for transformation I'm I'm definitely the woman for the job. And if they're not, I'm not. But I have no disrespect to people who don't yeah. do hands. I mean, what people do is what people do. Why Why? Why would that bother me? Yeah. I love but, it. But we have the power it. to transform. And, you know, yeah. my a couple of my clients over the years have said, she's not a painter and decorator. She's the builder. Mm. Mm-hmm. I, that's, that's a pretty accurate description of what I do. That's what you want, yeah. If that's if that's what they want me to do, and if that's what they're open for, and if the context mm-hmm. allows me to do that, and if I feel that I have the energy to do that, I'll give it my best shot. Yeah. This is I'm I'm. This is a call to arms. Is anyone listening? You're that's you're you're want. you're ringing the bell, and I and I love it. I love I. I feel just such a, a deep power. In that, and, and in in your in your presence and what you're sharing, I really appreciate it. Yeah, there's a humanity to it. You know, the thing about it is, is I was once at a place where I couldn't see my next move, and different people in in science and reading and whatever it was took me to a different place. And I, I'm just grateful to whoever that was and to myself that I made those moves, and now I see the world in a completely different light. Mm-hmm. And and if, if I can do that for somebody else, geez, I just think that's what's all about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's, uh, that's the name of the game. I if, think. The, if that's the game you want to play, I yeah. think that's yeah. the best way yeah. to play it. Yeah. 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 It's kind of, it's kind of like, well, if this is what you, if this is, if this is the game you decide to play, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that there's a lot of rules to learn to the game. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would definitely say that, the science, albeit challenging, and the integrity of the science has been a key part of playing this game for me. The science has shown me so, so much that I, that other sciences I don't think showed me. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, um, wondering if, if we could just pivot a little bit and I would like to hear a little bit about uh, rule govern behavior and what's, what's important to know about that. Absolutely nothing. (laughs) Absolutely nothing to know. Nothing, nothing. Well, I mean, I mean, I think as a scientific concept, I think it's in pretty big trouble. Okay. Um, I think it was an older way we used to talk in, in the days of RFT. Mm-hmm. And I think you can talk about people following rules in an unhealthy way in their lives. 
but that is so simplistic and topographical. I just can't work at that level. I mean, rule following, I don't think you can really say is a technical term. It doesn't say anything precise. So it's not that useful for understanding. I mean, so what is the behavior of following a rule? It's all sorts of things. So it's quite surface level, and I think we see that now. I mean, if you look at, for example, the work that Colin Hart has done on his PhD on, on the, um, the MDML and relational complexity, and I mean, that just blows the old concept of rules right out of the water. It's such precise, powerful, incredibly detailed work that I think it is a move forward from what we were thinking about, the way we were thinking about rules before. And it's just far more helpful in clinical work and it's more precise experimentally. Hmm. Okay. So nothing. Forget about it. I'm just saying move on from it. I'm not- I just saying, let it. I just, I, you know, let it go and and okay. look at a more precise way of talking about that behavior. And and Colin's PhD is a really excellent example of a more precise way of talking about what we were talking about when we were talking about rules. Okay, All right. is that published yet? Some of it's published. Three or four of it's published. Yeah, if you go on the Go RFT website, everything that's published, you know, is up there and. Okay. There are already a couple of Collins articles and they're just so, so precise and clear that mm-hmm. and they just really make a very strong case for that was the starting position, but this is bad. This is more complex. And um, any, any, could you give the kind of takeaway? Um, yeah. On, on so, where, where it's gone? Um, so... <sighs> It's really, so instead of just talking about distinction relations and coordination, instead of just naming the frame, right, which we used to do a lot of, and instead of just talking about the functions that were attached to that named frame, right, we now, we now ask you about, like if I mutually entail, like me bad, let's just say me equals bad, for example, mm-hmm. too simple, but mm-hmm. it's the strength of me bad relating that I need to know about in therapy. Because the stronger it is, the harder it's going to be for me to change, right? And the more locked in the functions are going to be. Now, if imagine just me bad is really coherent. It's got a high level of relational co- uh, coherence to it. The relate, like, you know, in practically every context, I'm going to mutually entail me with bad, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then it's not like con- that contextually specific, is it? Because in practically every context, when I go me and I'm going to mutually entail bad, or when I go bad, I'm going to mutually entail me, right? Mm-hmm. I need to know the strength of the coherence. Yes. And that in order to know how to change it, I need to know how complex the relational network that that's in. Is it me bad in this way, me bad in this way, me bad in that way, me good? Sometimes I need to know all that compl- as a lot of that complexity. I need to know how coherent it is. I need to know how often you've derived a mutually entailed relation between me and bad, because if you've derived it over and 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 over, you've derived it so much you don't even think about it anymore. I can guarantee it's going to be hard to change. And if I tried to create something like, but you are good in this way, you're just not going to believe it. It's going to be totally relationally incoherent. Yeah. So and what Colin's PhD does is it shows that the that the 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 dimensions, the, the the scales along which you measure the strength of a relational response, they have massive implications for how you go about reducing the strength. Okay. Huh. So it's um it's not just seeing that, but seeing the strength. Because what you wrestle with as a clinician is the strength of the behavior. Mm-hmm. That's 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 the obstacle. The obstacle, the stronger the behavior, the harder it is to change. It's not just knowing the behavior is a mutually entailed relating between me and bad. Mm-hmm. It's knowing the size of the, the history yeah. behind it, because that's the size of the obstacle. Okay. So it's, you know, whether you're dealing with a tape or epoxy that's holding them together, kind of. Exactly, and, exactly. And, and rule-governed behavior just stopped at that they were they were joined. I, I, that's what I think. Yeah. It's just, it just okay. tells you they're connected and that they've got hold over your feet. 
Mm-hmm. But how strong is the hold? Okay. How much of your feet? I mean, what functions? Yeah. Rela- functions are often attached to relational coherence. Relational coherence is such a powerful dimension on any relating behavior about the self mm-hmm. that given the experimental work, we just can't ignore it. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful that the world has GoRFT in your lab. And, Me too. Uh, yeah. And the people in it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also just grateful about how, you know, one of the things that really attracted me to, to CBS and ACT was just how unstuffy it was. And I know that's not in every circle, but I, I think that, you know, the thing you talked about earlier in terms of the equality amongst us, I, I, I really, really, it was, I think probably one of the first times I was trained in a therapy where I, I didn't feel like it was like we were talking about clients and therapists as two separate species, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And um, I just, I don't know, I just really appreciate that. And, you know, you sharing everything that you've shared about your journey, um, you know, clearly you've, you've done some work, you know, mm-hmm. not, not just intellectually, but, you know. And uh, I think that's just so vital to, to us being able to help others. We got to do our work. Yeah. However, however we do it, because in that way, we're all just the same. Yeah. Yeah. There's no difference. Sometimes the obstacles are greater. Sometimes they just look greater. It's the process. You, the process you struggle with is the same one I struggle with. They just have different functions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm... Uh, very grateful. Thank you for for sitting down across the globe with me. Yeah, you're welcome in these difficult times. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, very difficult. And uh, I'm telecasting from the United States, and I, I feel obligated to apologize for our government. And uh, um, and I and, and and I remember uh, at a FAP training I was at in Montreal or Sevilla that uh, they started out with a slideshow about, you know, apologizing for our, our leader. And um, it was funny, but it's not, it's like, it's not funny anymore to me. It's really sad. And so, I don't know, that's my sidebar on that. Well, you, I think we all have things to apologize for in a way, because, yeah. you know, you know, sometimes I feel like I have to apologize because I'm white. Sometimes I think mm. I have to apologize mm-hmm. because uh, I'm, I've had a healthy life. I mean, I just... I just want to, to know that if I could change something, once I knew it was wrong, I would change it. I can't take back what I've done yeah. or what people before yeah. me have done, but I, I, yeah. I do my absolute best to, to, to respect every yeah. other human being and, and where they're at. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of countries, you are originally from... Ireland, Northern Ireland. Ireland. Yes. Okay. Northern Ireland. And I want to, you know, I want to mention an artist who I think is doing some beautiful work, a poet from Ireland who I, I think is speaking a, a lot of the principles that, that get touted in CBS. And uh, her name is Kate Tempest. Are you familiar with her? No, I'm not. I, I'm too okay. busy reading science to do that. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm missing out. She's, a, she's an author, a poet and musician, and uh, she is so powerful. She has a beautiful, a beautiful, uh, piece called people's faces and uh just the she i I would love to see her on stage at uh you know a conference i think she she would be a great wow so so, yeah so okay so so um um your website is go rft go folks go go yeah go there people go it's amazing and uh i i uh yeah i i actually i wish i would i wish i would have it, you know, for, for someone who's teaching, I think it's just a phenomenal place to show students. Uh, yeah. And, um, and you're available for consultation. You could contact yeah, you through the, I mean, the I think it's just worth recognizing that, um, I'm just about to leave the Academy. I'm about to say goodbye to science and, uh, ah. I just can't do science and clinical work at the same pace I'm doing. It's, it's not yeah. healthy and it's not sustainable. And, and there's a, a huge demand now for clinical training and things. And I think I can better serve the world that way. Okay. Um, and stay fresh and healthy. So um, by the end of September of this year, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll hang up my scientific gloves and, and, and do more clinical work. 
And what, what will your day-to-day look like as far as clinical work? I think about? it'll look, it'll look like more training. Uh, I mean, and I love the clinical work I do, but you can only ever reach a very small number of people. When you do therapy with one person, it's one person. They're extremely valuable, but it yeah. is only one person. And you yeah. know, I'm in my fifties. I'm not going to live forever. So, you know, I would like to try to, you know, earn a comfortable living by contacting more people. I think I've done what I could do in the scientific world. I'm at a place where I'm comfortable to let it go now, but I want to take what I've learned and and move it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And on that note, I want to, I want to also ride the coattails of what you just said, because I've got another project that I've been working on and it's a, it's a podcast and it's called honorable evolution. And what I'm doing is, is I'm talking to the healthiest people that I can find about, you know, in their respective domains of health, what they're doing. And, um, and because I want, I, I, I really think this idea of what is health is, is a, it's a nebulous, nebulous, difficult thing in this culture of, 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 um, self, you know, and this toxic culture we have in gen in, in a lot of ways in terms towards health. I think it's mm-hmm. important that, that leaders voices get out there. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm excited about that. So I'll, I'll put that in the show notes as well yeah. to folks. So, um, okay. Well, thank you so much. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you for being my guide this far into the forest. I feel, I feel I like I'm some guidance. Yeah, you have, you have. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me But I'm getting strong